My name is Neil Sharma with Peninsula Open Space Trust, and my job today is to provide a brief overview of what makes Coyote Valley such a special place for wildlife, and to tie that to how the Coyote Valley planning process will pull all the information we have together to identify projects and approaches so we can best support biodiversity and ecosystem health, both in the valley floor and more broadly throughout the region. Okay, starting us out, here we have a snapshot of some of the wildlife living in and passing through Coyote Valley. And what I love about this is how it represents such an amazing diversity of life. So these are animals that rely on this place. Uh, it's a place that's been identified as one of the six most important landscapes for conservation in the United States. And Coyote Valley, along with the rest of the Bay Area, has been recognized as a biodiversity hotspot of global significance. So that term biodiversity hotspot that's really getting at two key elements. Uh, it's getting at species richness, meaning there are a lot of species here, including some that are only found in this place. And on the other hand, this is a setting that has experienced a substantial amount of habitat loss. So it's got that richness and that pressure, making it a biodiversity hotspot. Valley floor habitat in particular has been uh, almost entirely converted permanently to other uses. So it's a particularly precious resource. All right, so looking down for above, we're just using a, a basic aerial image as a guide today. And uh, just looking at the aerial, we can see that contrast between the large areas of habitat uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains to the west, so that's on the left side of the screen, the Diablos to the east on the right side of the screen. So contrasting that with the urban areas. And then we have Coyote Valley circled uh, in that yellow orange color and that's what we see as that last chance landscape that's preventing the isolation of those large areas of habitat is when ecosystems become isolated, we know that things start to unravel and that's what we need to avoid and prevent here. And so we'll zoom out just a bit further and, and, and focus in on that connective value because that is what, uh, it's a huge element of what makes Coyote Valley so special and irreplaceable as a last chance landscape. just spend a few moments here talking about the idea of connectivity, what it is, why it's so important. Connectivity can be described as the safety net of nature or the life support system for nature. And what it is, is it's that, that principle that uh, is so important to allow species to meet their different needs, which look quite different as we'll get into uh, in just a moment here. In, but broadly speaking, it's needed so that different animals can find habitat or the mates they need. Uh, to reestablish following events like wildfire or disease, or to gradually shift their ranges over generations potentially in response to changing climate conditions. So it's this fundamental thread for healthy and resilient ecosystems. And I like to think of connectivity in a, in a sense as the embodiment of ecology, because it's all about interrelationships and systems. And so as important as it is for us to think about the needs of individual species, we also think of it as a system and a community of interrelated parts and participants. And so that's an important lens for us to employ when we're looking at this landscape and think about the needs of today and also looking into the future and, and how we can best support this system to adapt to change. And so the planning process is a really important element that will identify those specific opportunities and needs on the landscape here. Okay, so we'll spend a, a, a little bit of time here on a series of vignettes of some very different animals, uh, really to explore the idea of how connectivity looks different to different species and how it's important for us to be mindful of that complexity. So here we have on the screen, this is a puma or a mountain lion or a cougar or any number of other names. It's, they are all applying to the same animal, but this is the apex predator that we have in the region. But we know that apex predators are crucially important for healthy ecosystems. We also know that the Santa Cruz Mountains population and potentially in the uh, part of the Diablos as well are isolated, meaning they're not able to, uh, at least to the degree that they need to, to exchange genes through reproduction with each other. And so what happens with a population that we're seeing here is that is the effects of inbreeding, which can lead to the loss of genetic diversity and negative effects on the health of the population. So if we don't solve this problem, we could be looking at local extinction. If the top predator is lost, then what we've seen in other situations is that causes the Im an imbalance in the system that cascades further uh, if it were to take place. So among other things, that's what we're working to prevent and have a, a great opportunity here in Coyote Valley to work on that issue. Okay, here we get an up close look at the California tiger salamander. 
Uh, and if we go straight to the next slide, please. So this is an animal that's born in a pond and goes through a metamorphosis. So we have uh, one that's going through, uh, on the previous slide we saw an adult, and then on the right-hand side here, this is a, a photo of an animal of a California tiger salamander that was just taken earlier this year, uh, going through metamorphosis. And then once it completes this process, it leaves the pond and goes to the uplands where it spends its adult life in rodent burrows. And then it eventually returns to its birth pond and reproduces and, and continues the cycle. And so this is a, an animal that's experienced pressure from habitat loss, introduced predators, it's sensitive to pollutants, uh, rodent suppression. So what happens when rodents are taken out of the landscape? Well, there are gonna be fewer burrows that, that this animal is gonna rely on in its adult life. So starting to see those interrelationships. And then not to mention other features in the landscape. You know, I like to think about a curb, which a, a mountain lion or the, where we visited previously could step right over that, no problem. But a curb starts to look a lot like a wall when you're the size of a salamander. So just thinking about those features and with, as, as we're planning for how to restore habitats and, and make sure these are connected features in the landscape. And there's a really promising intersection between habitat restoration for aquatic and riparian species here and some of these broader sustainable water resource management um, strategies that, that we're collectively working on that I think will be covered in one of the upcoming webinar series. And then here we have the Western burrowing owl. And I'm not gonna try to take too much thunder here. I know we have the San Francisco Bay Bird Observ Observatory here. I'd uh, love to hear more from them on this species, but this is uh, an animal that needs low vegetation. It's also experienced a lot of habitat loss. Uh, in addition to low vegetation, it, it needs a safe uh, refuge away from tall trees where predators might be perching. It needs healthy ground squirrel populations, which can contribute to the burrow network that the, the burrowing owls will use. So this is unfortunately a species that's an extremely steep decline in this area. And Coyote Valley presents opportunities to support recovery efforts. So it's a brief visit to three very different animals intended to illustrate the remarkable diversity of wildlife in Coyote Valley. And so as we get into the planning process, one of those key elements is to bring together the best knowledge on all these different species, the habitats and the ecosystem overall in order to design the restoration that'll address the pressures the wildlife are facing. So now we're gonna step back uh, to look at the landscape itself and some of the habitat conditions out there. And it's quite varied, heterogeneous landscape. So here we're looking at an image taken at the Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve, great habitat. It's some beautiful serpentine plant communities here in the foreground, uh, also looking at open meadows and oak woodlands. But at the landscape as a whole, yeah, we're seeing a, a quite a, a variety of conditions. So habitat that's been converted for use in uh, more intensive agriculture. There's some residential uses in Coyote Valley, and then roads are a feature uh, that's quite prominent across the landscape, looking from one mountain range to the next. So this is a map that's showing the movement of 26 bobcats that were fitted temporarily with GPS collars. This is work that we did with UC Santa Cruz and a firm called Pathways for Wildlife. And each color here represents an individual bobcat. And uh, what this showed for us is uh, highlighting the areas of the valley floor with the most intact habitat, really covering quite a variety from riparian habitat, habitats in Coyote Creek to the oak woodlands and meadows when we look at across the valley floor. So highlighting those areas of the most intact habitat and also telling us quite a bit about wildlife and roads in Coyote Valley. And that's a continuing area of study as we try to figure out how we should best create permeability uh, across those features, meaning creating uh, safe places for passage, reducing wildlife collisions, roadkill, and, and the sort. Um, so one of the things that this study contributed to, as well as some uh, previous work, was identifying Monterey Road as a roadkill hotspot. And so that's what we have highlighted here is Monterey Road. Uh, roadkill hotspot, important wildlife crossing area, particularly in between Bailey and Metcalf, which is directly adjacent to the that crucial area that's been that had been protected in 2019 by post the Open Space Authority and the City of San Jose. So really important piece of the puzzle here as we think long term about the solutions. The Monterey Road corridor is also the planned route of the California high speed rail. So thinking about this all together through the planning process uh, as important as an important feature to address through restoration. In addition to Monterey Road, we have all these other roads. And so when I just a few moments ago was alluding to continuing study, 
We know Monterey Road is an issue. We have uh, conceptual ideas for how to make that safer for, for wildlife and drivers, but we need to build on that understanding for these other roads that, and figure out what the conservation approach is there. So at least on Monterey Road and potentially in other locations, we know that there's a need for dedicated wildlife crossing structures. So what we see here are examples of uh, an, what some call an undercrossing or an underpass feature on the left in Oregon. And then on the right is a, an overpass or a land bridge that was constructed in Wyoming. So these are tested and proven concepts that are very effective. And we know that at least in the case of Monterey Road, uh, these are part of the puzzle that we need to implement moving forward. And so we've continuing study going on uh, even as we speak. This is, so in just a moment, we'll check out a short clip from a, a study that's underway uh, that we're conducting with the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency and Pathways for Wildlife. And so this is a bobcat watching the traffic go by on Santa Teresa Boulevard. So if you wouldn't mind playing that. And maybe we'll play it one more time, how about it? So this is a study where we'll understand the, where wildlife are finding safe passage, where there are problem areas. So similarly to, to studies that have been previously done and, and led to our understanding of Monterey Road, this is what we're now employing on Santa Teresa Boulevard and Bailey Avenue as inputs to the planning process as we think about this landscape together. So I'll wrap here uh, just to celebrate that we're at this point in time where we're building upon the great progress made to conserve those key properties in the valley floor. And, and now we're here kicking off the Coyote Valley planning process as, as such an exciting milestone and a turning point to be able to look at this landscape holistically, assess those opportunities and needs all together in context, and then chart that course forward to support wildlife and in turn the integrity of the ecosystem.